Chapter Six, Part Two of the Seven Stairs by Stuart Brent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six: The Man with the Golden Couch, Part Two. One could not remain a passive spectator in this little world. If you can imagine a great hall with many rooms occupied by solitary persons somehow bound to one another by invisible, inextricable longings, with myself dashing, hopping, skipping, running from one room to another, you may have a sense of the nightmare my life was becoming a fantasy in which some incomprehensible crisis was always arising, or in which my business or personal life might be interrupted at any hour of the day or night by a call from Lionel, and the despotism of his utter and absolute need. In my heart, I knew that my dream of being the Shelley of the book business was rapidly disappearing. The act of dressing for an evening, of looking at the same well-cared-for, well-groomed, vacuous people, eating the same tired hors d'oeuvres, hearing the same gossip, filled me with an almost uncontrollable rage. Yet I was still caught up in the excitement of being part of this new-found pretentious world of middle-class wealth. The first time I was really shaken was at the Christmas party. Along with others, I had helped trim the gigantic tree while Lionel sat and amused us with tales and gossip. The decorating job was truly a work of art, and we were all quite pleased with ourselves when we left, the members of the inner circle lingering for a few minutes after the others were gone before offering their thanks and good nights. We were saying our good-byes when Lionel turned suddenly and looked at the pillows on his huge couch. "'They haven't been fluffed up,' he said in a voice of command. Immediately several young analysts left their wives in the hall, dropped their coats, and rushed back to fluff. The whole action was so unexpected and infantile that the blood rushed to my head and for a moment I was dizzy and unable to focus. And I had let myself in for this sort of thing. Jenny and I left without saying good night. There is a time when one goes toward Lionel, and another time when one goes away from him, an analyst who had once been part of the inner circle remarked. This indeed seemed to be the case, but my inner conflict remained unresolved. I was ashamed of living in a midnight of fear. At the same time, I felt privileged to know this gifted and so often generous man who understood the human soul as few others have. I respected and loved him and wanted to befriend him in every way that was not a violation of my own being. As a group, I found analysts the most sensitive and intelligent to be found in the professions. But there were those I could not tolerate, no matter how much they spent at the shop. The shock artists who fed off the agony and terror of the bewildered, and the culturally illiterate who viewed anything dealing with the creative as their province the atmosphere would begin to sizzle at the seven stairs the moment any of the latter started analyzing man, guide, Dostoevsky, Ibsen, Kafka, Homer, anybody and everybody. I had read Freud's essay on Leonardo da Vinci and Ernest Jones on Hamlet with great interest, and decided that the whole approach was one of intellectual gibberish, regardless of the serious intent of these great men. But the young and unread analysts were not even serious. When you cross-examined them, you found that they had never read the plays or books in question. They were merely quoting an authority and taking his word for it. Of course, 
It is a nasty thing to expose anyone, and it is sacrilegious to do it to an analyst. The change in my relations with some of the psychoanalysts became increasingly less subtle. To offset some of the business losses attendant on this turn of affairs, I hit on the idea of giving a series of lectures in the store after closing hours. I offered a course of five lectures on great men of literature at a subscription price of ten dollars and was surprised to find I was talking to standing room only. After a month's respite, I tried it again with similar success. Emmett Dedman, then literary editor of the Chicago Sun-Times, heard one of the sessions and was responsible for recommending me as a replacement for the eminent Rabbi Solomon Goldman when he was taken sick before a lecture engagement. The success of that one lecture was such that I was booked for thirteen more. It seemed as though all was not lost. It's a big world, I assured myself, sitting alone in the shop before the fire. The sun does not rise and set with a handful of analysts. It was a cool October night. Business that day had been particularly good. My debts were not pressing. I took heart. In apparent response to this cheerful frame of mind, a smartly dressed customer entered the shop, a man of medium build with blonde hair parted in the middle and a pair of the bluest eyes I had ever seen. "'I'm looking for an out-of-print recording, the variations on a nursery theme by Donagni, he said. "'Perhaps you may have it.' The accent was unmistakably British. It was obviously my day. I did have it. I have something else, also out of print, that might interest you, I said. It's the Donagni Trio, played by Heifetz, Primrose, and Fearman. Oh, that, he said. I know that one. I played it. I hesitated, sensing some kind of ambiguity. I'm Primrose, he said. We chatted while I wrapped the records. He was charmed by the shop. It had a really English flavor, he said. Before I knew it, I was telling him the whole story of the seven stairs. Until what time do you stay open, he asked. It's quite late. I'm closing right now, I said. If you have time, let's have a drink, he suggested. I should like to hear more. On a sudden inspiration, I asked first to make a phone call. While my customer browsed among the books, I spoke with Lionel and asked if he would like me to bring William Primrose over. He was ecstatic. At first note, his voice had sounded forlorn, so empty of life, that I guessed him to be terribly sick. But mention of Primrose acted like a shot in the arm. Hurry, he cried. I told Mr. Primrose that my friend had a wonderful bar and a devotion to great music, but he had already heard of Dr. Blitzton. Isn't that the analyst? he said. My friends in the Budapest Quartet often used his home for rehearsal. So off we went. Lionel was at his best, charming, informative, genuinely interested in the small talk carried on by Mr. Primrose. I was delighted really to have pleased him. When I left Primrose at his hotel that night, the world seemed good again. Yet, on the way home, I began to have hot and cold flashes. Why had I called Lionel and offered to bring Primrose? Why? A pleasant period followed, warmed by ripening friendships. Jenny and I attended the Primrose concert and dined with the great violist afterward. In years to come, I was to see him frequently and even present him in a memorable concert in my own shop. While at Orchestra Hall to hear Primrose, 
we had also encountered Dr. Harold Lofman and his wife Marilyn, and through some instant rapport agreed to see each other very soon. The result was an enduring friendship, as well of one of the most pleasant parties ever held at the Seven Stairs, a showing of Hal's pictures which he had painted in North Africa during the war. They were brilliant, highly individualistic works. My impressions of disease, he said. The party was a delight, particularly because there was no question of selling anything. The artist could not possibly have been persuaded to part with any of his pictures. There was nothing to do but pass out the drinks and enjoy the company, which included a lovely woman with reddish-gold hair out of a Titian portrait who wanted every book and record in the shop, and who was later to deliver our first son. She was Dr. Catherine Dobson, an obstetrician, an analysand of Dr. Blitzton, and a great and good friend. The day after our son was born, I received a call from Lionel. "'What are you going to name the baby?' he asked. "'We've decided on David,' I said. "'David,' he said. "'That's too plain. Why not call him Travis? I just love the name Travis.' I admitted that Travis was fine, but perhaps a bit fancy. After all, I said, Jenny wants to call the boy David. What's the difference? A great deal of difference for the boy's future, he said. I love Travis. Suggest it to Jenny. I had to admit to Jenny that I was afraid to take a stand. But was it too much to give just a little and to keep things working for us. "'Why are you letting this man ruin our lives?' she asked. When I couldn't answer, she relented. David was named Travis David. In the days following, I was afflicted with a recurrent rash and sometimes by mysterious feelings of terror. I had gone wrong somewhere, and a secret decision had to be made. I picked up the phone, dialed the number, and made an appointment. I started my analysis because I was in trouble. I needed expert help, and I went out and got it. Later it dawned upon me that this is really the significant thing. Not that there are so many people in today's world who need help, but the miraculous urge on the part of the individual himself to get well. The fact that people on the whole don't want to be sick, don't want to be haunted by nameless difficulties, convinces me that at the very bottom of one's being is the urge to be good, to the good. This is more important than any description of the experience of analysis, which, although it may be invaluable to the person who suffers through it, is but a process of living, nothing more. After all, it was Freud who said that life is two things, work and love. As I came to tentative grips with my fears of rejection, and the self-rejections these fears imposed, I began more and more to act like myself, like the man who started the seven stairs. If Hamlet's problem lay in his fear of confusing reality and appearance, so too was mine. Only I was not Hamlet, and my task was not the avenging of a father's murder. My task was even more basic. I had to just keep on giving birth to myself. It was a long time before I perceived that Lionel Blitzton was less a cause of my problem than a factor in its treatment. Who was this strange and often solitary genius, who died leaving such a rich legacy of interpretive techniques to his profession, who lived like an ancient potentate, offering to a crowd of sycophants what ever satisfactions are to be gained from basking in reflected glory. My relationship with him revealed things which 
I was slow in admitting to my analyst. I shall never forget the energy I expended telling my analyst how good I was. Fortunately, I wasn't in the hands of a charlatan. He interrupted me, one of those rare interruptions, and told me that we both knew how good I was, so quit wasting time and money on that. Lionel was like life itself, an amalgam of selfishness, egoism, cruelty, of goodness, gentleness, compassion. He offered it all in almost cosmic profusion and with cosmic capriciousness. Once he remarked, the world owes me nothing. When I die, I will not be sorry. I had joy, still do. I had love, still have it. I had friends, still have them. I had all, and felt all, and saw all, and believed all. I had everything, and I had nothing. I had what I think life, in its total meaning, is. I had the dream, the Chulum Mensch. This, I believe, is what he was, a Chulum Mensch. It contained everything a dream could and should, good and bad. And much of it was glorious. No one who shared this part could thank him enough for the privilege of being admitted. End of chapter 6please subscribe to update new videos please share and like if you enjoyed the video thanks so much